October 22nd, 1979, Linwood, Washington. A 24-year-old woman is found dead inside her home. Bound and shot in the head, police find no evidence and have zero suspects. For 32 years, this case would go cold until a deck of playing cards inside a prison produced the confession police needed to bring her killer to justice. This is the story of Susan Schwartz, the Queen of Hearts. Hey, y'all, I'm Chris Calvert. And I'm her husband, Rob Potworth. Welcome to Hitch to Homicide. For better or worse. Till death do us part. Welcome back, everybody. Yes, welcome, welcome, welcome. And for our friends in Albania. Albania? Yep. Mirisavini, Mirisavini, Mirisavini. Sometimes I think you just start at the top of the alphabet and work your way <laughs> down to places. But that's just a theory. No, last show I had Togo. <laughs> Well, wherever you're listening, be sure to hit that subscribe button, then like, rate, and review the podcast so other people who are like you, other people who are obsessed with true crime, Mm -hmm. can find us. And if you're watching on YouTube, hit that subscribe button below. Please do. You can find us on Instagram at Hitch to Homicide or on X at H2H underscore podcast. And if you want true crime every single day of the week, please go join our closed Facebook group, The In-Laws and Outlaws. Go to Facebook, type in H2H In-Laws and Outlaws, answer some questions, and you're in. Some of you are not answering the questions. <laughs> Got to answer the questions. <laughs> we need to make sure you're ready for whatever we put in that little group. Yep. But go join. Yep. I like to post a lot of other stuff in there, and people are in there naming cats, and let me tell you what, like (laughs) true crime names of criminals for cats. (laughs) I was laughing so hard at that the other day. (laughs) We also now have a Buy Me a Coffee link if you want to send Rob some coffee. He drinks it every single episode. You can find that link in our show notes. Still Mm. no Diet Mountain Dew link. Just saying. We appreciate all your messages and emails. Thank you for being with us every single week. We're so glad that you are here. Yes, we are. This is an older case. It was cold for a really long time. I've kind of been on a little streak of these. Yeah. But um, Cold case file, cold case file. (laughs) But this one's so interesting because it's all solved with um, a deck of cards. Oh, really? How about that? Wow. Before we get started, let me thank some sources. The Everett Washington Daily Herald, the Oregonian newspaper, newsblaze.com, On the Case with Paula Zahn, and the Kirkland Reporter. Well, you ready? I am. Let's do it. Susan Schwarz is born on September 16, 1955. She has a sister, Valerie, and a brother, Gary. Susan's dad is Henry Schwarz. She also has a mother who doesn't get along with her daughter very well. Okay. Well, maybe not at all. Mm. There's a little bit of evidence that maybe Susan's mom was an alcoholic, this according to interviews with her brother. Okay. Susan attends Bothell High School in Bothell, Washington. (laughs) Bothell. And it's not me with a lisp. It really is Bothell. <laughs> <laughs> that was like Athol. Yeah. Athol. Yeah, exactly. Was that Scotland? Athol, Scotland? Yeah. I think that was right. So you're not Cindy Brady. Mm, no, no n- not Cindy Brady. No. <laughs> but Bothell, Washington, where she and her best friend Karen were both in love. Susan's high school sweetheart was Bill Hassler, and Karen's high school sweetheart was Greg Johnson. Okay. Now, because Susan's relationship with her mother is strained, when Sue turns 18 in September of 1973, she leaves home, and she's going to live with her boyfriend, Bill. And her BFF, Karen, actually marries Greg Johnson, her high school sweetheart, right out of high school when she, too, is 18 years old. Starting young. That's young. That's young. Six years later, in October of 1979, Susan is still in a loving relationship with Bill. They live together in Linwood, Washington, in a little house. 
Linwood is a sleepy little town, mind you, especially back in 1979. They've got a population of less than 20,000 people, Hmm. but they're really a part of Seattle Metro. It's just 16 miles north of Seattle. I came from a town of like 19,000. So, (laughs) yeah, and we weren't close to anything. (laughs) (laughs) Just wide open spaces. That's it. But it's a small town close to the big city. Gotcha. Susan and Bill are what people might consider free spirits. And back in the day, some might have called them hippies. Mm -hmm. They liked music. They liked being with their friends. And they liked to smoke a little weed. Susan was beautiful. She was vibrant. She was popular. She would do pretty much anything to help her friends. And she was always looking for ways to improve on herself. Mm. She loved to read and expand her vocabulary. Like she would read a thesaurus. Really? It's like Ben Stiller in Dodgeball. He's (laughs) reading the dictionary. (laughs) <laughs> he likes to break a mental sweat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> She's expanding on her vernacular, gotcha. which is another word for vocabulary. And now I have just become a human thesaurus. There you go. Her best friend, Karen Johnson, described her as the it girl amongst her friends. Karen also said that Susan would do anything for her. And she did because these two are like sisters. Gotcha. But Karen has a problem. Karen's husband, Greg, is beating her, like Mm. really abusing her. Really, And this started almost immediately after these two get out of high school and get married. Okay. And by 1979, Karen has a little baby boy, too. And when Karen comes to Susan and tells her how bad it is, saying that she was terrified of Greg, Susan tells Karen, you've got to leave him. You've got to get out. You need to leave him now. Right. Yeah. And Susan actually says to Karen, quote, you can do so much better than him, end quote. Hmm. You see, Susan loathes Greg for what he's doing to Karen, and she wasn't afraid to stand up to him. And Greg despises Susan (laughs) because he thinks she's overstepping her bounds and putting wild ideas into his wife's head about leaving him. Hmm. By the way, a lot of her friends don't call her Susan, they call her Sue. But I'm going to call her Susan because all of the resource material called her. All the sources called her Susan. Okay. And because maybe Karen wasn't strong enough to do that on her own, Susan helped her best friend and her son to get into a battered women's shelter Mm -hmm. and away from Greg. Good for her. And after this, Karen goes to Minnesota, taking her little son with her. And she's going to be in Minnesota for a couple of months between September and October of 1979. Okay. But Karen returns in early October and spends all of her time with her BFF, Susan, because Greg has a new girlfriend. Oh, he didn't waste any time. They're not even divorced yet. Wow. Greg's got a new girlfriend, a 17-year-old girlfriend, whose name I won't say. In the records, she's referred to by only her initials. I'm just going to call her the girlfriend. Okay. But Karen comes back thinking that maybe, just maybe, she would reconcile with Greg. Hmm. And Susan says, don't do it. Don't do it. Are you nuts? Yeah. Susan supports her friend Mary right up into the day of October 22nd, 1979. Okay. And that morning, that Monday morning at 20805 Locust Way in Alderwood Manor, Just before leaving for work at 7 a.m., Bill asks Susan to deposit a check for him. And she says, no problem. She's not working. So she's like, no problem. I can deposit the check. Mm -hmm. Bill's leaving for his job in construction. Then sometime between 9 and 10 a.m., Susan decides to take a shower. And while she's in the shower, Greg Johnson and his new girlfriend show up. Greg went into the home of Bill and Susan alone and then came out with stereo equipment and said to his girlfriend, quote, the woman is in the shower. I want you to help me take some weed and money, end quote. Really? Yes. Okay. So the girlfriend follows him into the house. She steals the weed and Susan's wallet. And Greg actually tells her to go get some jewelry as well. Then she turns and goes back outside to sit in the car. He tells her to wait in the car and she notices that Greg is holding an electrical cord in his hand. Mm. He's cut it from a nearby blow dryer from the bathroom. So Susan's in the shower, blow dryer's in the bathroom. Yeah. He's in there while she's got the shower curtain closed, cutting the cord off of the blow dryer. That can't be good. No. 
the girlfriend gets to the car and she thinks something something really bad is about to happen. Yeah. So she turns around and she goes back inside. And Greg has pulled Susan out of the shower by the hair of her head and is yelling at her, who, by the way, is not backing down. Susan's not backing down. Mm -hmm. Greg screams at her saying that she's the reason he and Karen are getting a divorce. And Susan doesn't cower, according to the girlfriend. She gives it right back to Greg. But then, according to the girlfriend, Susan goes from telling him off to begging for her life. Mm -hmm. Greg pistol whips her. Then she's saying, please don't. He binds her hands with this cut electrical cord, and he stuffs Susan's black bra down her throat as a gag. Wow. Greg wrestles Susan to the floor, and as she's pleading for her life, he takes a pillow, puts it over her head, and shoots her in the head. Then he shoots her one more time. Wow. And the girlfriend's standing there? It's then that Greg looks up and sees the 17-year-old girlfriend. She's standing in the doorway. And he says to her, quote, it's that easy. This is what happens to people who f*** with my life, end quote. Then he shoots Susan again, saying, quote, if you ever open your mouth, this will be you and your family, end quote. Wow. He leaves Susan's hands tied behind her back and covers her body with a towel. Then the two of them walk calmly out to his red car. The girlfriend is terrified. Of what's just happened. Can you imagine being 17 years old Uh, and witnessing that? Yeah. When Bill Hassler comes home that afternoon on October 22nd, the front door is open. Not unusual because they left their doors unlocked a lot. Yeah. It was the 70s. Yeah. Yeah. The house was clean. Also not unusual because she was a very meticulous housekeeper. Mm. Everything in its place and every place has a... Wait, I'm saying it wrong. Every, (laughs) this is why Chris is not organized like this. A place for everything and everything in its place. There you go. That's what it is. (laughs) That just goes to show you that I have nothing in its place. (laughs) That was good. But Bill sees the check on the counter that Susan promised that she would take to the bank that day. And it's still in the same spot where Bill left it for her. Right. So he calls out to her and then he finds her face down in the floor There's blood spatter on the walls from the gunshot. Mm. He loses his mind and he runs next door to the neighbors for help. They call police. He's frantic. He's telling the police that his girlfriend, Susan, had been attacked in their home. Mm. Now, Officer Stephen O'Connor of the Snohoma Sheriff's County Department gets the call. And the dispatcher calls it a, quote, unknown problem, end quote, which O'Connor knows is code for something really bad uh, has just happened. And we don't want to say it over the police radio. Right. OK. Because back then, a lot of people had scanners oh, and yeah. police radios. Yeah. yeah. I actually have a scanner on my iPhone. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> I do. You're looking for bless your hearts, aren't you? <laughs> I'm searching high and low. <laughs> there are some accounts that just give... The things that come across the scanner and it's it's the police scanner and it's pretty funny. Yeah. Those are pretty funny. Yep. But yep. Officer O'Connor is first on the scene. Sue is lying face down. Her hands have been tied with this electrical cord behind her back. Her body's covered with a towel. Her body is halfway in the bathroom and halfway into the living room area. Okay. Backup is called, and Joe Ward and Ken O. Christensen, two detectives with the Snohomish Major Crimes Department, show up. They'll be taking on the case, as will many other detectives over the next three decades. We got to strap it on for this one. Wow. The detectives search the house. There's an empty 22 shell casing and also a live round on the floor also a 22. Mm. There's blood all over the walls and hair pulled from her head, meaning her scalp. It's on the floor. This is why they know she was pulled from the bathroom by the hair of her head. Right. And she was pulled hard. The electrical cord was cut from the hair dryer and around her head is her black bra and nearby is a pillow with a bullet hole through it. He's used it to muffle the sound or maybe he just doesn't want to get blood spatter on himself. Yeah. There's no evidence of a forced entry, no open windows, no broken glass, no furniture has been moved. It looks like the home is still in place. And the crime scene basically shows the police that she was dragged out of the bathroom 
toward the living room, then bound with the electrical cord behind her, gagged, shot in the head, not once, but three times Jeez. at point blank range to the back of the head, execution style, wow. which really shows the police. They're like, there's some rage involved yeah. in this crime. Yeah, big time. So the killer is someone she either knows, she let him in the house, or what they believed happened at the time, her front door was just open and someone just walked in off the street, right. surprised her in the shower, then killed her. Right. I mean, I get it. Small towns, very trusting. Yeah. It is 1979, just like you said. Yep. But the shower aspect of the case makes me think of Psycho. Mm. And did you know that after filming that scene... Janet Lee refused to take showers for years. Really? She would take a bath instead for 35 years. Wow. She didn't get back in the shower. Well, at least she took a bath. <laughs> <laughs> but that's some PTSD. Yeah, big time. Yeah, but think about it. I mean, when you're in the shower and you're in the house alone, I think that's a fear because maybe you feel vulnerable in the shower. You got soap and shampoo in your eyes. Sure. You're naked, you got your eyes closed if somebody's in your house and you don't know it because you can't hear anything. And you're confined in a small area. And you're in a small area. Yeah. yeah. I actually slipped in the shower and fell one time <laughs> and I thought, oh my gosh, Rob's going to be up here to like pick me up any second. And I just laid there. <laughs> I was in the in the studio with headphones on, so I didn't hear a thing. And the whole time I'm thinking, this is it. This is how I go. I'm going to fall out of the shower and hit my head. Oh, man. And then I just laid in the bathroom floor waiting. <laughs> Nobody ever came. I had Sorry, to crawl honey. up by myself. Sorry, honey. <laughs> and I even said to him, where were you? And he goes, I didn't know. I didn't hear anything. <laughs> Y'all, it had to have sounded like the house was falling down. No lie. Uh, anyway. Didn't hear it. I digress. Okay. But when you're in the shower, people, lock your doors and windows. Yeah. That's my advice. Just lock your doors and windows, period. <laughs> yeah. When police are in the house, Detective O. Christensen remarks that Susan and Bill's house is, is immaculate. It's one of those houses, like I said, everything's just where it's supposed to be. Mm -hmm. Just like my office. <laughs> I jest. If you know what a creative person's desk looks like, it's a lot. Oh, yeah. Maybe I should take a photo and post it in the in-laws and outlaws. Yeah. I did do a post of, of a photo of the tangled cords on my desk, <laughs> and all of Rob's friends, all of Rob's music friends, it triggered some of them <laughs> because all of their cords are always neatly dressed, <laughs> and mine were just like everywhere. Curse of a musician. Yeah. They yeah. were – it was triggering yeah. for most of them. Exactly. But Susan's house is so clean that these detectives are absolutely certain they're going to find evidence mm -hmm. that's going to lead them to the killer. Right, right. Because everything is pristine. So if there's evidence they're going to be able to find it, this is going to take them straight to the killer. They know they're going to find fingerprints. Right. But they find nothing. Wow. They dust the house from top to bottom. What they do find is footprints in Susan's perfectly vacuumed carpet. Mm. So she's one of those people who vacuums in rows. Yeah. Like her carpet is perfect. And I actually read that they had just had new carpet put in. So it's that real plush pile. She's vacuumed in lines and they can see footprints. Well, and too, it was the 70s. So, you know, that was that. that what kind thick, of carpet was it called? Thick shag. Shag carpet. There you go. <laughs> this wasn't shag. I've seen pictures. Oh, okay. Yeah. But it is a thicker pile. So okay. she did have like. The back and forth, you know, Wrigley Field mm -hmm. on the, the carpet in the living room I'm going on. I'm very disappointed. It's the 70s and they didn't have shag carpet. No shag carpet. Man. Mm -mm. <laughs> but what they did see, that there was one set of footprints that were the size of a man's shoe and another that were much smaller, a woman's, like a tennis shoe imprint. Gotcha. And they're not Sue's because Sue is barefoot. Right. And these are shoe prints. Mm. Meanwhile, Bill, Susan's longtime boyfriend, is a hot mess down at the police station. Yeah. When they question him, he's distraught and upset. He loves Susan. He does tell the police there are things missing in their house, stereo equipment and some jewelry, and Sue's wallet is gone. Mm -hmm. And the police aren't really thinking that it's a burglary gone wrong just yet. Right. They think it's been staged to look like a burglary. Mm. Still, they collected everything in the house, the bra, the electrical cord. There's blood on the countertop in the bathroom. They take that. 
But why would anyone want to kill Susan? Yeah. Because when they start asking around, nobody had an unkind word to say about her. So she has no known enemies. Right. Now, remember, the police have searched the house from top to bottom looking for evidence. And what they do find is weed. And they question Bill over and over and over again about the marijuana. Mm -hmm. Now, in Washington state, it's legal to have less than one ounce of weed, harvested or bud, 16 ounces of weed-infused edibles in solid form or 72 ounces in liquid form and seven grams of marijuana. So that was allowed in the 70s? No, that's now. Ah, okay. Yeah, seven grams of marijuana concentrates, I should say. Sorry. Gotcha. That's legal now. Gotcha. But in 1979, it was a bigger deal to have weed in your house back then. yeah. And Bill finally admits that, yes, he and Susan smoked pot, and he was dealing a little bit to support his habit, but that didn't make him a killer. Right. And police contact Bill's boss and ask, did he show up on time that day? Did he work a full shift? And in fact, Bill's boss was with him all day long on October 22nd. So Bill has a solid alibi. And that's good. But in the beginning, they're really looking at him. Yeah. So police have Bill walk through the house so he can tell them if anything is missing. The stereo, some of Susan's jewelry is also gone, her wallet. And this forces the police to switch gears. So maybe it was a burglary gone wrong. Maybe it didn't have anything to do with him. Right. Now the police think perhaps, well, if he's dealing drugs and somebody came in here and it's violent, this is a drug deal gone bad. Hmm. And this really pisses Bill off. (laughs) And he tells him to stop looking for drug dealers and start looking for Susan's killer. Yeah. But the police think that this is their only lead. And so they want to follow it. Sure. Meanwhile, the police start asking around who wants to hurt Susan, can't find anybody who would have a motive. The coroner's report shows that there's been no sexual assault, even though she's naked. Now, the police really believe that someone Bill may have sold weed to came back. Mm. And they're thinking, Bill is a bigger dealer with more money or more weed at the house. And somebody came in and surprised Susan looking for that weed and that money. And they took it and then they killed Susan. Right. But still, they don't have any evidence of this. Right. So they go to Susan and Bill's neighbors to see if anybody heard or saw anything. And Susan's neighbor told the police that around 9.45 a.m. that day, he had knocked on Bill and Susan's door, but she didn't answer. And as he's walking away, he heard something that sounded like, quote, a squealing pig, end Hmm. quote. Really? So now they have a time reference. Right. But he doesn't think too much of it at the time. The neighbor doesn't. Right. But the police think that's when the actual struggle took place. Hmm. Now, because they're still holding on to this drug deal idea, Barry Fagan, a narcotics detective with Snohomish County, is brought in. He starts with his informants and asks, is there any word on the street about Susan's murder? Well, there's nothing. In the summer of 1981, 18 months after the murder, a rookie detective, Alan Zerlo, is assigned to investigate a report of someone, a suspicious someone, one of Susan's neighbors saw in the neighborhood on the day she's killed. Mm. And the neighbor says she saw this man holding something under his arm. Maybe it was a gun. Right. Maybe it was the stereo. Right. Detective Zerlo gets together with this eyewitness and he brings with him a sketch artist and they make a composite sketch and the police ID the man. They're like, oh, we know who this is. Oh, really? This is Ricky Hartman. Oh. Ricky's a local guy. He's got a history of dealing drugs and petty crimes like burglary. So now their attention is turned to Ricky, who coincidentally lives right around the corner from Bill and Susan's house. Mm, They bring Ricky in for questioning, and he says he's got nothing to do with the murder of Susan Schwartz. They search Ricky's home and his property. They find absolutely no evidence, and he takes a lie detector test to prove it. And when the police pin him down on what he was carrying under his arm down the street that day, Ricky admits that he was carrying his bong. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Ricky likes to take his own bong to his friends' houses. If Ricky's coming to see you, he's bringing his own Mm, bong. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) So police are now back to having zero leads. 
Seven years pass. Mm. Susan is officially a cold case. Then on January 16th, 1986, a young woman named Molly McClure is found murdered in her apartment in northern Seattle. She's been strangled, gagged, her hands tied behind her back with an electrical cord Mm. and shot. Barry Fagan hears about this new murder and he calls Seattle PD and says, I need everything you've got. This sounds very familiar. And Seattle PD takes Molly McClure's upstairs neighbor, a guy named Sherwood. He went by Cavay, Sherwood Cavay Knight. I'm going to call him Sherwood. They take Sherwood into custody. He's got a rap sheet in and out of prison for burglary and assault. And Seattle PD, they have DNA of Sherwood. And this DNA is all over this 24-year-old Molly McClure. Mm. And when the Snohomish County Sheriff's Department digs into the life of Sherwood, they find he has a connection to Susan Schwartz. Mm. Sherwood Knight's half-brother, Greg Johnson, was married to Susan's best friend, Karen. Yeah, it's like uh, six degrees of Kevin Bacon. Yeah, six degrees of Kevin Bacon <laughs> yeah. or anybody else. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> but they did actually speak with, the police actually spoke with Greg Johnson because they knew that he was the husband of her best friend, of Susan's best friend, back right. in 1979 when she is murdered. Okay. And he says, I was down at the pier fishing, and then his half-brother, who ends up is Sherwood Knight, Confirms this. Says, Mm -hmm. yes, he was fishing with me that day. Okay. But he and his half-brother, they have the same mom but a different dad. They're both criminals with records. And suddenly, the police think Susan's murder is ready to bust wide open. They want Sherwood to spill his guts. And they want Greg Johnson to turn on his half-brother for murdering his wife's best friend. Hmm. So they go looking for Greg And guess what? They want to talk to him, and they go looking for him. Right. His ass is already in prison Uh, because in 1985, he's convicted for armed robbery. But Greg liked to talk, and Greg tells the police that he was in the car that day that Susan was murdered. He said he and three others went to Susan's house and that Sherwood and two other men went into the house while he stayed outside. He says he heard a snap from inside the house, and the guys came out with some stolen stuff. Greg told police his brother said, quote, I hope we don't get caught for this one, end quote. Okay. Then Greg says he didn't know until later the person they'd killed was Susan Schwartz, his wife Karen's best friend. All right. Lies. Yeah, I, I'm going, I'm really confused right now. All lies. Yeah. These two brothers are going to do, turn each other in a lot. He did it. No, he did it. Why are just they do- wait. I mean, are they just trying to get a, a reduced sentence? Is that what well, the deal well, is? Well, one of them's already in, in prison. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay, whatever. I think they just hate each other at this point, <laughs> or they're just turning on anybody. Okay. Now, a couple things are wrong here with this story. The police have the footprints on the carpet, one set of male, one female. They don't tell Greg this. Right. And his story doesn't match up with what little bit of evidence they do have from the crime scene. So they still have nothing, just a half-brother willing to snitch, but no evidence. Just a story of a known liar and thief. And what you're saying? Snitches? Get. Stitches. (laughs) That's right. Go ahead. (laughs) Now, Detective Fagan has said that in his gut, he knew it was one of them. It was either Greg Johnson or Sherwood Knight. One of them. Mm. But they can't prove anything. And this case goes cold for... 26 more years. Jesus. It's colder than a cast iron toilet on the shady side of an iceberg. And we know how painful that can be. And we know how cold that is. <laughs> but Susan's family wants somebody brought to justice. And in 2005, a cold case team in Snohomish County is put together and headed up by Detective Jim Scharf. We've talked about him a little bit yeah, before. I recognize that name. And at this point, it's 2005, DNA is a real thing now. And that's when Susan's family saw a change. Detective Jim Scharf starts digging. He brings this whole case back to life. 
and they go over the evidence and they send the DNA to a crime lab for any possible matches. And they did such a good job when they collected the evidence that it would be, they just know in their heart it's going to be fruitful. Something's going to come of this. Right. They had the electrical cord, the shell casings, blood evidence. They had everything the attacker might have touched, including the bra and the pillow. It's all sent in for DNA testing. Okay. But they get nothing back. Really? Because all the DNA that is recovered, it belongs to Susan. Uh, wow. Yeah. But now they want to talk with Susan's best friend, Karen, Greg's ex-wife. Mm. 26 years later, Karen is still really bitter about her ex, Greg Johnson. When they first met, she thought he was handsome and fantastic. And now Karen tells Detective Scharf she was having trouble in her marriage to Greg back in 1979 because he was beating her. And Susan, being the best friend who'd do anything for Karen, mm -hmm. Susan encouraged Karen to leave town, take the baby boy she shared with Greg, and just go. She tells the detective that Susan's words were, quote, you can do so much better, end quote. Right. And Karen admits to the police that Greg hated Susan. And likewise, Susan loathed Greg. Right. And that Greg believed Susan meddled too much in their marriage. And for the first time, the Snohomish County police have something to go on in yep. Susan's case. Ding, 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 ding. Now ding. they have motive. Right. Now, Karen, even though she's apart from Greg, she keeps in touch with Greg's mom. Her name is Helen. Mm -hmm. And Helen mails to Karen a letter. It's a letter between Sherwood and Greg, between her two sons. All right. And now Karen has it. And she tells police, I don't know a whole lot more than I did right after her murder the first time, right. but I do have this letter. Okay. It's a letter written by my ex-brother-in-law, Sherwood Knight, who is serving a life sentence for the murder he committed in Seattle. Okay. And Sherwood has written to Greg saying, uh, and I'm going to paraphrase here, right. Greg, you told me you were going to help me and you haven't done anything. If you don't get me in an attorney within a month, I'm going to give this letter to the police. But the letter isn't an out and out confession. No, all it really says is, Greg, if you don't come up with the money, $2,000 to help me get out of jail and an attorney, then you, meaning Greg, can come and, quote, take my place. Whoa. So it's a little bit of, you said you were going to help me, yeah. you're not helping me, right. and if you don't do what I ask you to do, you can come in here and take my place. Hmm. Now, Sherwood Knight is threatening to rat out his half-brother, Greg Johnson, but that's it. Right. And what he's got to, to rat out Greg for is unknown at this point. Right. It could have been anything. And he also says in the letter, I've been, quote, keeping your secret for all these years, end quote. Whoa. Yeah. Karen sends the letter to the cold case unit, and they start digging into Sherwood Knight's life. And the thing is, there's this cryptic reference in this letter to a Mrs. Millman's secret. Hmm. And detectives have no idea who Mrs. Millman is, and Karen doesn't know either. It's another dead end until Detective Scharf takes a cue from the state of Florida. You see, Florida started using playing cards to help with their cold case files. Really? And today, most states actually use them. It's a deck of playing cards printed with 52 cold cases and their photos and the information that's known about the murders. Okay. And they hand these out for inmates to use. And if they can help solve a murder, they get a reward of some type. Oh. So if you've ever been locked up with someone who liked to brag and you see their victim on a playing card, you might, in order to help yourself out a little bit, come forward and say, well, my old cellmate said yeah. X, Y, and Z, and it was about this person on this card. Get an extra bag of potato chips. Maybe. <laughs> time served. I don't know. Yeah. In late 2009, Snohomish County has their own cold case playing cards, and they're distributing them to all the prisons in Washington State. And Susan Schwarz is the queen of hearts. Yeah. Her card reads, Unsolved Homicide, Susan Schwarz, 26-year-old female. She was actually 24. They got her, um, her age incorrect on her card. Okay. At about 4 p.m. on 10-22-1979, Susan was found dead in her home in the 22800 block of Locust Way in Alderwood Manor. 
property was missing from the home. If you have any information, call 800-222-TIPS. Okay. They put 5,000 decks of cards out there. Wow. In the hope that they will get some leads, not just on Susan, but on the other 51 cases. Sure. Now, at this point, 31 years have passed since Susan's murder. It's amazing. And it's now the summer of 2011. And Sherwood Knight has been playing with a set of cold case cards. (laughs) And he finds Susan, the Queen of Hearts. And at this point, he hates his half-brother, Greg Johnson. Yeah. And he decides he wants to talk to the police. He's going to cash his chips in. And the police want to talk to him, too, because of this letter. But Sherwood Knight, he reaches out to the cold case team first. So they have this letter. They don't really know what to do with it. Right. But it's not until he sees the Queen of Hearts that he goes to, that Sherwood goes to his counselor there in prison and says... I know this girl. I want to talk. So he actually reached out first. Okay. The police come to prison. They interview Sherwood. They take a statement from him. They're thinking he's going to confess to Susan's murder because of the murder of Molly McClure or that he's going to be able to explain himself over this letter that he had sent to Greg Johnson. Sure. Because Sherwood doesn't know police have this letter Mm. when he's called them. Okay. And Sherwood gives them something, but not what they were thinking. Sherwood says he was at the top of the pier fishing on the morning that Susan is killed, October 22nd, 1979. When he's done for the day, he tells police that his half-brother Greg rolls up in his red car and says, quote, I need you to tell everyone I was down here fishing with you today. Ah. I was here the whole time, end quote. Wow. And when Sherwood goes... Why? Greg says to him, quote, because I killed Sue, end quote. Oh, man. Oops. Sherwood tells police that when he asked how it happened, Greg said, quote, I grabbed a pillow, put it over her face, put the gun behind her left ear and one shot, end quote. Man. And police are thinking, okay, but did Greg murder her or you? Because you've got the details correct. Right. But Sherwood gives him something else. When they ask, who is Mrs. Millman? Sherwood tells them without hesitation, well, that's Greg's girlfriend. (laughs) She was with him the day he killed Susan. Wow. Two sets of footprints on the carpet, one male, one female. Yep. The 17-year-old girlfriend was with Greg, the girlfriend who had never been interviewed by the police. Mm. And Sherwood says, listen, I'm guilty of providing a false alibi all those years ago, Mm -hmm. but I didn't kill her. I'm not guilty of murder. Right. Then Sherwood gives her name. And here's the story on the girlfriend. Her dad died nine months before she meets Greg. She's totally grief stricken and not in the best frame of mind when she meets him. She's 17 years old. Sure. Greg actually encourages her to leave her mother to become estranged to her mom because Greg wanted her to rely solely on him. Right. And this girlfriend moved in with Greg, and just like with his wife, Karen, he began to beat her, and he threatened to hurt her if she ever left him, and he allowed his friends to use and abuse her Uh, as well. Now, none of the reports said sexually, but if I was a betting girl, I'd say yes. Yeah, absolutely. When the police showed up at this girlfriend's house 31 years later, she said at first that she didn't know anything. But then they tell her, well, there were these smaller footprints at the house that day Susan was murdered. We think there was a woman there that day, and we'd like to get your DNA to rule you out. Hmm. And she says, no. No. Uh But when they really press her, She finally breaks down, and she told the truth, saying, yes, I was there. And then she just starts crying. Like one of the detectives said that she had to, like, she was sobbing into his chest. Mm. She tells the police the whole terrifying ordeal. Greg told the girlfriend on the morning of October 22nd, 1979, he needed to see a woman about some money and drugs. And the girlfriend didn't know who they were even going to see or where she lived. And she tells police that she's been living with, quote, it, Hmm. meaning Susan's murder for 31 years. She's been living in fear for her own life and that of her family's. 
And when she's questioned, the girlfriend gives the details of the murder so well and in such detail that she is a, she's matching exactly what they found three decades ago. Right. And the detectives know she's telling the truth. Right. She's telling the whole story about him saying he was stealing weed and money because she owed it to him. And he told her to stay in the car. And then he came out and said, she's in the shower. So she knows all of this. Mm -hmm. I need you to come inside, get some stuff. He's whispering her to her, get some jewelry. Yeah. And she wasn't supposed to be there for the murder. And she tells him that. Right. I was supposed to wait in the car, but I went back. And that's when I witnessed Susan fighting with Greg. And I watched Greg tie her up with an electrical cord and shoot her three times at point blank range. Man. And back in 1979, Greg's girlfriend was never questioned, and she never opened her mouth. In fact, when Greg was released from prison in the late 80s, Greg called this old girlfriend's mother's home. His ex-girlfriend just so happened to be visiting her mom, and Greg gets her on the phone and says, quote, I'm still around, and I know how to reach your family, end quote. So he's still threatening her to stay quiet. That's scary. Now, like I said before, Greg was in prison in 1985 for robbery. He went back to prison in the year 2000 again for robbery. And when he got out that time, he went back again for another six years on drug charges. (laughs) And at that time in 2011, Greg is out of prison. So when the girlfriend gives her confession, it's 2011, Greg's out of prison. Right. So they have to go looking for him. And because they have a witness and probable cause, they now have a case. And they find Greg at a halfway house in Seattle. And at first, he kind of cooperates with the police. He talks about his marriage to Karen failing. But when they switch it around and start talking about Susan's murder, he becomes ultra defensive. Mm. They tell him what Sherwood said. Dude, here's what (laughs) your half brother said. Oh, man. Then they tell him your ex-girlfriend has given her story, too. (laughs) And then... Greg looks at the police and says, I don't want to talk to you anymore. (laughs) They arrest him, and he's charged with the murder of Susan Schwartz. The DA is ready to take him to trial, but in 2012, he agrees to plead guilty to second-degree murder. And on March 23, 2012, Greg Johnson is sentenced to life in prison, 32 years after he murdered Susan. Wow. Wow. Now, the anonymous girlfriend has met with Susan's family. She has apologized for never speaking up. She has said, quote, I can't say I did it right, but I did the best I could. I had to protect my mom, end quote. Of course. So decades later, Susan's family and friends finally have justice. And it took the two women who feared Greg the most, the killer the most, his wife and his girlfriend, to bring him down. Mm. I will say the media attention was really tough on Susan's brother and father. Her dad didn't even follow the court proceedings after Greg was arrested. He actually relied on his son to sort of relay the information to him. Right. Her family was forced to find their own closure a long time ago. Mm -hmm. And they worked really hard to do that. And I think they were thankful that Greg was caught. But at the same time, it just opened up all those old wounds again yeah yeah wow so girl power obviously you know here's the thing susan was like get out and karen her best friend does get out and greg the wife beater holds her responsible right and then turns again to the 17 year old girlfriend after he's killed susan and you know is threatening her yeah he just threatened all the women in his life and the fact that it was 32 years before he was brought to justice is, is absolutely crazy. It's amazing. But that is the story of Susan Schwartz, and that's all I have to say about that. She is only one, but what if one is all that's needed? Hospice nurse Indy Luce has fallen in love. After caring for billionaire Louis Thornberry until his final breath, she's now engaged to marry the heir apparent of the global tech empire, David Thornberry. But as the divinely marked Indy packs up her old life to begin anew, a sacred promise comes back to haunt her with a vengeance. As an unrelenting spiritual battle unfolds in the shadows, the descendants of those like Indy find themselves persistently lured and ensnared 
as a relentless surge of evil becomes an unstoppable force. With malevolent entities following her every step, what Indy doesn't know about her family's sacred covenant could tip the scales of good and evil. The follow-up to the paranormal suspense novel Lead Me From Temptation and book two of the Divine Darkness series Deliver Me From Evil is now available March 29th, 2024, wherever you buy or download books or go to chriscalvert.com. If evil prowls seeking someone to devour, can one woman seek and save that which is lost? You know, the hardest thing about this whole case Obviously, I mean, the murder and everything, but th- that she had to keep that secret for 31 years. Yeah. Yeah. Can you imagine living with that oh my day gosh. in and day out? Yeah. I mean, it had to be, it had to feel good to unburden herself yeah. of all of that and know that they're safe because now he's in yeah. prison. But I actually think if she had been a little bit older and she realized if she turned him in, yeah. that he would have gone to prison and she wouldn't have had to worry about him. Yeah. At all. I mean, you think about it. It's 17 years old. What? 16, you're really a kid. 17, you're still really a kid. I was a kid at 20. Yeah, I was exactly. a kid at 20. I was a kid until I think I graduated college. And even then I was calling home to mm-hmm. find out how I did my ta- – how to do how do you do your taxes? Yeah, I'm still yeah. a kid. <laughs> <laughs> what is renter's insurance, Dad? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Oh, man. <laughs> So, yeah. Yeah. Well, well, listen, let's go from the queen of hearts to bless your hearts. Well, bless your heart. All right. We're going to start with number one, and I'm calling this junk in the trunk. Ooh, I feel like I got some <laughs> junk in the trunk. Didn't used to, but old age and sitting on my butt all day. Well, <laughs> do that to you. <laughs> stop it. Two New York City women were arrested after allegedly trying to smuggle cocaine inside the homemade diapers they were wearing. Oh, my gosh. Can I just stop you and (laughs) tell everybody that you love to watch the show? What's it called where they're coming into the country with drugs? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. To Catch a Smuggler. (laughs) One of my favorite shows. I make Chris watch it all the time. No. I I will walk in and he's watching it. And I'm like, no, really? Are they smuggling cocaine and the the gross fish from China again? I want to watch Below Deck. I just know that, (laughs) hey, that's my one. I know. That is my one vice. Yeah, I like Below Deck. I watch Below Deck, you guys. It's my <laughs> one vice. I love it. I love it. That's yeah. the only thing. I never get to watch it when it's actually on. I have to, like, wait and watch it when I have a chance. But I know. I know. you can watch your smuggling show, <laughs> and I'll watch the yachties, right. the naughty yachties act bad. <laughs> All right. Well, they were wearing diapers. Now, Priscilla Pena <laughs> and Michelle Blasingale arrived at John F. Kennedy Airport from the Dominican Republic when a drug-sniffing dog alerted custom agents. So there's something strange around Pena's midsection. Pe- uh, this really is your show. This yeah. is the exact same thing that happens. Yep. Yeah. An agent patted down both women and found a hard object around their stomach and buttocks. <laughs> a partial strip search revealed diapers containing about 15 pounds of cocaine, wow. CBS New York reports. Yeah. Yeah, they were they were putting some junk in their trunk. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez. Okay, number two, wing nuts. Wing nuts. Yep. Two Atlanta men were arrested after they allegedly tried to steal 26,000 pounds of chicken wings. <laughs> Both men were employees at a cold storage facility where the frozen Tyson chicken wings were stolen. Ooh. Yeah, the men allegedly backed a rental truck to a bay door at the center and proceeded to load up 10 pallets of Tyson frozen chicken wings. Oh, my wings. gosh. Now, I love chicken wings, but, man, that's ridiculous. Police <laughs> estimated the value of the stolen wings to be about $65,000. Oh, $65,000 worth of wings? You got it. The timing of the theft, <laughs> yeah, the timing of the theft coincided with the weekend of the Super Bowl. Oh, yeah, poultry industry officials yeah. estimate about 1.2 billion wings will be consumed over the weekend of the Super Bowl. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah, yeah. Well, they got busted and uh, they're 
See you. Bye-bye. I just want to say I'm seeing a pattern here because first we're talking about people smuggling drugs and then we've moved to wings. These are all <laughs> things that Rob loves. So if the third one is something close that he really <laughs> like, we're going to have a trifecta. So I'm waiting with bated breath for number three. <laughs> yeah, this one is not even close. <laughs> but I do love chicken wings. Oh, yes, my you God. do. Oh, barbecue chicken wings. I don't, anyway. eat, I don't eat wings. No, I love them. Okay, number three. He didn't get the memo. Well, this might be you, too. (laughs) (laughs) No, it's not. Trust me. A Utah man stole a truck so he could race to stop an ex-girlfriend from getting married. Police report. In Utah? Yes. (laughs) I know. Andrew Curtis, 30, was charged with a felony theft of a vehicle. Stealing a car to stop a wedding? Haven't seen it. Not in my career. Corporal Justin Hoyle told Los Angeles Times. I've, ne- I've seen a lot, but I've yeah. never seen this. I've never seen that one. Police said Curtis stole the truck that had been left running and drove to see his ex-girlfriend, then crashed the vehicle in a church parking lot, caused $1,000 of damage. Wait a minute, back up. Somebody left a truck running and <laughs> wasn't inside it? No, they just left it running. <laughs> He jumped in and took he off. He just jumped in and took off. Yeah. He thought it was a sign from the <laughs> Lord. <laughs> yeah. He wants me to stop this wedding. I need to stop this yeah. wedding. Now, despite Curtis's efforts, the ex-girlfriend would not talk to him. Surprise, surprise. Can you imagine if your ex <laughs> crashed a car that he'd oh stolen God. into your wedding? Oh Talk about God. crashing the wedding. Oh, ba dum bum very nice. I'll be here all week. Yeah. Try the deal. <laughs> I'll be in the red room. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. There's your bless your hearts for this week. <laughs> oh, man. Well, if you have a bless your heart or you know somebody's heart who needs blessing, all you got to do is go to hitchtohomicide.com where there's a pull down menu. And while you're there, you can also suggest a case yep. or tell us your own true crime story. Yes. That's all we have today. That's my amazing husband out there, the king of hearts out there. <laughs> That's my queen of hearts in the, in the booth. <laughs> Join us next time on Hitch to Homicide. <laughs> Bye, y'all.